available everywhere podcast hello everyone and welcome back yet again to the gsmc fantasy sports podcast we are in the home stretch of today's show and our fourth segment we'll be continuing with this theme of tiers and be looking at the running backs now the running back landscape is a little more set in stone in terms of how i profile them as poet sears and sages says i didn't consider gino before but i might give him a second look now well i'm glad that after that segment poet sears and sages you will be considering him i love him as a seattle fan i think him getting a second chance in this league is such a fantastic story and he lived up to it also worked under dave canales so that smith and mayfield connection and that dave canales connection really is what makes me like these guys so i'm glad that you are considering gino smith and it comes from me poet sears and sages so thank you for the comment but let's get into the running backs because the running backs are more of an interesting commodity because like i said they aren't as set in stone in terms of ranking them in tiers as the qbs were these are guys where you can kind of pick and choose your poison here because a lot more people employ the hero running back system or zero running back system than any other kind of strategy in fantasy. And so if you are going to be employing that system, your strategy is like, how do I leverage your picks in all these different rounds? Instead of, you know, just going by tier and thinking, okay, now that I know who's gone, let me pick based on what tiers people are projecting these players as. So without further ado, let's kind of break down more round by round than tier by tier the running backs. Obviously, in tier one is Christian McCaffrey, class of himself. Like I said in the previous couple of segments, he is far and away the best running back, best all-purpose player perhaps in the NFL, best fantasy player. Yes, the injury history, blah, blah, blah. But if you are picking round one, pick one, he is chalk. He is set in stone as the number one pick. Then, here's where it gets kind of interesting. Because in the latter to mid stages of this draft, in your draft, you might be thinking about picking another running back. And if McCaffrey is already off the board, Hall and Robinson should be the next two guys to consider in the late to mid first round. And the reason why I think Brees Hall is kind of in this conversation is because he was third in scrimmage yards amongst running backs last year. And the reason why I think Bijan Robinson is in this tier is mainly because now feels like it's time to come alive in this offense. Now feels like the opportunity for him to really set the standard as being one of the best cornerstones for that Falcons offense. I don't think you can go wrong with either of these guys in the mid to late first round. Now, here's where things get even more interesting because tier three is a clear drop off from these three guys. We have CMC, Miles above everyone else, Hall and Robinson kind of in the middle, and then round two, you get a little bit more open leverage here. So say you don't go along with the hero running back narrative might wait a little bit then jonathan taylor saquon jameer gibbs and derrick henry become available to you and i like all four of them but the one who i'm really looking at right here is jameer gibbs now we talked about barkley yesterday a little bit we talked about jonathan taylor on the show before and we already know how i feel about derrick henry especially in the raven setup we haven't really talked about jameer gibbs and I think Jameer Gibbs, even though the Lions are a team kind of centered around Ben Johnson, who have been getting the best out of Jared Goff, they also realize, even though they didn't do it in the NFC Championship game, sorry Lions fans, that that they have value in the running game. Jameer Gibbs should have gotten the ball more in the NFC Championship game. I'm not harping on that. It's just a fact because the Lions run game is the very special sauce to what they do. It's not just all about, you know, leveraging Jared Goff. It is about the running game. John Muir Gibbs in round two should go a lot higher than what people are expecting. Him. Maybe even the first pick in the second round. So this tier is really up to your interpretation because if you're one of those people 
who is willing to wait till round two when the running back market widens a little bit, then you should be comfortable with that sentiment. Then round three is your Pacheco's, ETN's, and Kyron Williams. And out of all of these guys, I actually don't like Kyron Williams as much as people are saying, just because he feels very much like a one-season wonder. I'm not sure how he will profile over more seasons in the Rams system, especially if Matthew Stafford leaves. I really think that people are underrating Isaiah Pacheco, though. I think that he adds a lot of value as a receiving back, and I think that Mahomes is starting to realize him as a weapon who may not be a traditional running back who can get in the open field explosively, but he is a guy who can get the job done. He's more of a workhorse guy. So if you do want that balance, you already have someone like a, a Hall or Robinson, let's say, Macheco will be the pick for you. And then in rounds three through four, that's where it opens up even a bit more. Mixon, James Cook, Josh Jacobs, Samir White, a guy who I really like, Alvin Kamara. And let me talk about some of the pratfalls I faced in my draft. I ultimately drafted James Cook way too high. And I think that James Cook, even though he looks like in this new offensive setup for the Bills, like he will get a lot of targets and touches, I still think that he's not someone who, like me, you should be shrewd about and immediately going for. But at the end of the day, James Cook feels like someone who could be a steal. But a guy who I might fade out of this is Josh Jacobs. Because I was talking about how the Packers are not necessarily a run-friendly system. I think that he's going to be used as a more smash-mouth back. And I think that's what he is right now. As he's getting older as well, he is becoming more smash-mouth oriented, more a physical guy. Not a guy who can be that and also be explosive in the open field. But in terms of the running back tiers, I think that, like I said, it's not in stone, but it's more about how the draft pans out. Let's say you have, say, the 6th or 7th pick in the first round. That means that you've already known what has happened before. You know what chalk picks have already happened. And now you can really focus on setting the future tone of the draft. You really have more power than people who are picking one through three because you have the power to take the draft in a different direction. If you see someone's picking, say, Justin Jefferson or Amon Ross St. Brown, you can be like, hey, I want to continue this running back list. Let me pick a running back here. Let me see if... It makes sense for me to pick either Taylor or Barkley as Parker Bledsoe comes into the comments with another trade. I love this. I love this narrative right here. Should I take this trade? I get Achan, DK, Devontae Smith for JT, I believe that is Jonathan Taylor, Mike Evans, Dak, and Curtis Samuel. Hmm. So... This is an interesting trait because it has a lot of elements within it. So on your team, you have Jonathan Taylor, Mike Evans, Dak Prescott, and Curtis Samuel, and you get Richardson. Okay, I was wondering who AR was. So a four-player swap right here. And then you, in return, get A-Chan, Richardson, Devontae Smith. This is a weird one in my opinion, because Anthony Richardson for Dak. Let's start off with the quarterback. These are guys who are really weird in terms of how I project them both, because Dak is someone who I really liked early on in the regular season last year. He is a regular season guy, and he seems like he profiles, but that contract situation really is to hold me back and that whole narrative about how they feel like cd lamb is so important that they both waited and gave him the extension even before dak began his own talks that kind of gives me pause about him 
Then let's go to the wide receivers you get. You get DK and Avante Smith, and you are giving up Mike Evans and Curtis Samuels. We haven't really talked about DK on this show a lot. I like him. I like him. He's more of a late-round guy, but he is one of those guys who I value in terms of balance, and I love preaching balance. So I like that. You lose Mike Evans and Curtis Samuel. We talked about Mike Evans, how consistent he could be. But if you're giving up Curtis Samuel, who I don't think will profile as highly on the Bills, I think that that is someone that is that is a part of the trade that I think you are winning and getting DK and Devontae Smith. And then the running backs. H Han for Jonathan Taylor. I actually do not like Devin Achan, and here's why. I just don't like how the Miami Dolphins approach the use of speed. And I know it sounds weird because it's the thing that people expect them to get the most wins from, but if you have so many speedy players, the question becomes, okay, how do you divvy up the touches, the targets? And Devon Achan, let's remember, was a rookie last year, really came out of nowhere and probably will not profile as someone who can keep up that level of stats. And Jonathan Taylor, I think, has a lot of hope and optimism for this season, on the other hand. So I think this part of the trade is where I'm saying get rid of the A-Chan and JT part. But if we're just looking at DK, Richardson, and Devontae Smith for Mike Evans, Dak, and Curtis Samuel, that's an interesting part of the trade. Now, I think the whole question is about whether or not you feel Anthony Richardson will actually be better than Dak because that takes a lot out of the trade as well. But I think that if you trade three out of those three, then that's the most value. So thank you again, Parker Bledsoe. Very interesting trade because it's a four-player trade. A lot of difficult narratives here comparing and contrasting different positions and how you feel in terms of value. So thank you yet again for this. It was very helpful. I think that this trade will take us to the break, but keep them coming for our last segment. Our last segment will be talking about really, really deep sleepers. If you are someone who is willing to take a flyer on somebody, this segment is for you. We'll be back to conclude the show with that after this short break.